and welcome to the only televised debate in the 2017 Democratic primary for Brooklyn District Attorney. I'm New York One political anchor Errol Lewis, and we are coming to you live from Brick Arts Media in downtown Brooklyn. The next 90 minutes will be a commercial-free, uninterrupted conversation about issues where you will get a chance to learn more about the six Democratic candidates who will go before primary voters on September 12th in a bid to become the highest-ranking law enforcement official in our city's most populous borough. Tonight's debate is a co-production of New York One, New York One Noticias, and Brick. <coughs> My co-panelists tonight who will join me in the questioning are New York One Brooklyn Borough reporter Janine Ramirez and Juan Manuel Benitez, the host of Pura Politica for New York One Noticias. And for those of you following on Twitter at home, the hashtag is NY1Politics. Now let's introduce these six candidates. We welcome Ann Zwern, Amadou Ama Jumo, Vincent Gentili, Eric Gonzalez, Mark Fleedner and Patrick Gatlin. Here are the rules for the debate. The candidates know all about it. The candidates will have 60 seconds to respond to questions that are posed to them. They'll also be given the opportunity to respond if they are addressed directly by an opponent. We'll also have what we call a cross-examination, where each candidate will be able to ask one other opponent a question. And there will be lightning round questions in which answers must either come in the form of a yes or no or be brief in response. And we're going to start tonight with 45-second opening statements. The speaking and seating order was determined earlier today by random selection. We begin with Ann Swern. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I love Brooklyn. I'm a daughter of Brooklyn. I've raised two children here in Brooklyn. And for the last 37 years as a prosecutor, public defender, and law school professor, I've learned the difference of, between those people who can hurt us and those people who have just made mistakes. For people, I've learned how to keep people out of the system who shouldn't be in the system at all. For people who should be in the system but can be helped with drug treatment, with mental health treatment, and other programs, I've created the programming around that. I've seen what adolescents need, but some people need to go to jail too. I have um, dedicated my life to this work and I will fight to stop, I will stop criminalizing poverty, I will st end cash bail, and I will keep us safe. I will use the solutions that we have now, and I will use them from day one. Thank you. Next up is Ama Jumo. Yes, good evening, everybody. My name is Ama Jamo, and I'm running for Brooklyn District Attorney because justice matters. I went to Barnard College of Columbia University and Georgetown Law School. Right out of law school, I came right to the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, where I served for over 20 years. During the course of my service, I was able to create such an important bureau called the Crimes Against Children Bureau, fighting on behalf of the voiceless. My most noted work was the work I did on behalf of little, a little girl named Justina Morales and Nix Mary Brown. I was able to secure the convictions for their murderers. I'm the only one up here now who actually worked side by side with Ken Thompson when he was in the process for running for district attorney, when he was in the process of changing the face of Brooklyn, when he was in the process of putting an end to Hines and moving forward. So I ask you and I tell you, if you, justice matters to you, then you need to elect Ama Jamo for Brooklyn District Attorney because I'm going to rebuild the trust, I'm going to make sure that we have proactive justice, and most importantly, I'm going to fight for each and every one of you, Brooklyn. Okay. Justice matters. All right, next up is Vincent Gentili. Hi, everybody. I am a lifelong Bro Brooklynite who uh, spent 11 years as a prosecutor in Queens, so I know how to keep people safe. I, uh, for 20 years, have been elected official fighting for Brooklyn. I'm the only one here that can say that I have a record of fighting for Brooklyn for 20 years. Because of my work in Queens, I can come to this job much like Ken Thompson did uh, without fear or favor and without any allegiance to the old regime under, uh, under Joe Hines. I'm sitting amongst Joe Hines' management team right now. Uh, frankly, uh, I'm the only one, the only candidate here that, uh, that is not part of the Joe Hines Alumni Club. So I believe that I can do the job without fear or favor, but the problem is the old regime wants to have the office back. They want to come back and they want to run this office again. I hope Brooklynites on September 12th will say, we don't think so. We want an independent person to continue the independence from the old regime like Ken Thompson did. Okay, thank you. Next up, Mr. Eric Gonzalez. 
Good evening, Brooklyn. My name is Eric Gonzalez, and I am honored to be serving as the acting district attorney of the great borough of Brooklyn. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, and I grew up in East New York during the 1980s when crack cocaine had hit the streets of Brooklyn hard. My neighborhood was considered the homicide capital of New York City. And because I grew up here, that's what led me to become a prosecutor, because I knew that we could drive down crime, but also ensure equal justice for everyone. That's a vision that I shared with Ken Thompson, who selected me to run his office, but also to implement his critical reforms. Brooklyn's a lot safer today, but it also needs to be fairer. And I'm working very hard to make sure that we reduce our reliance on jail, give needed second chances to young people, and fight uh, Donald Trump and backward criminal justice policies. Thank you. Our next candidate is Mark Fleetner. Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Fleetner. I'm a civil rights attorney and the former chief of Brooklyn's Civil Rights Bureau. Uh, we live in troubled times, and so please let me be blunt. I am the DA that Brooklyn needs now. Why? Just last year, I secured convictions for two police officers who committed acts of misconduct. Uh, at a time when nobody else in the nation was accomplishing that. There was the, uh, the shooting of a Kai Gurley by an officer, uh, the shooting and killing, and an, and an officer who stomped on the head of a, res a restrained and unarmed man. Uh, and uh, these were the convictions that showed Brooklyn what equal justice could be. Bernie Sanders' group, Our Revolution, has endorsed me because they know that I have a plan to end broken windows, to end cash bail, to finally stop feeding into this for-profit prison industrial complex. Let's get to work. Thank you. Our next candidate is Patricia Gatling. Good evening, Brooklyn. I'm Patricia Gatling, and I believe the next district attorney needs to be a crime fighter, and a civil rights crusader. So let me tell you, you know, go Google my resume, but what I'm going to tell you is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to charge people for marijuana offenses in Brooklyn. I'm not going to charge people with prostitution in Brooklyn because I believe prostitutes are victims. And I'm not going to charge resisting arrest on on crimes like disorderly conduct because it's just not right. And if you want fairness, integrity, transparency, and equity in the district attorney's office, you will vote for me on September 12th because I've not only walked the walk and talked the talk, I've experienced manager and I know how to get this done. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start uh, tonight's questions with the uh, following. Among the most important legacies of former DA Ken Thompson's campaign, as well as his time in office, was the re-examination of cases that led to the exoneration of 23 wrongly convicted Brooklynites. For those of you who worked in the DA's office at the time that some of these wrongful convictions took place, what went wrong and what specific steps would you take to repeat, to uh, prevent a repeat of those errors and injustices? And let's start with you, Pat Gatlin. Well, the first thing I would do is create a prosecutor's integrity unit. When we look at those cases that um, were, individuals were exonerated, most of them the crux of the matter was prosecutors weren't doing the right thing. And so it's not only good enough to hire people and, you know, you have to have trust, but you also have to have penalties. And so this unit would sort of operate like the Internal Affairs Bureau almost. And we would guard against these kinds of Brady violations and, and treatments of witnesses and, and ID infractions. And what we do is we set up protocols and we have penalties and we have a unit that makes sure that they audit these cases and that we know what's going on. Because, you know, if you're the district attorney, you can't be at the 400 trials. And so you have to make sure it's not enough to just say ethics count here and we train in ethics and integrity counts. We have to make sure that they do what we say they have to do. And that's why we need a prosecutor's integrity unit. Thank you. Ann. Um, well, first of all, um, the, we should get it right the first time. Of course, we should have a robust unit that reviews these cases. It should be staffed adequately with really experienced lawyers and investigators with enough personnel that we deal with these cases efficiently, effectively, and that we, we that and transparently so that the public knows what, what the order of the dealing of the cases is, which cases we're dealing with, and what the results are. But getting it right the first time requires a lot of things. It requires the ability for all people who are interested in the case to actually have information. The defense community 
community has a huge amount of information that may exonerate a client or may be in, show their innocence. The advocacy community has that. If they don't have a, a person at the top to bring that information to, it gets buried. It's been buried recently with a 911 tape that a defense attorney was seeking to have uh, the prosecutor review for five months while a man sat in Rikers Island. The other thing, of course, is, and we spoke about this before, is the medical community has a checklist for quality control. We can do things like that so that attorneys and, and investigators can swear to the fact that they've searched their files, that they've looked through the evidence so that anything that's exculpatory or innocent bearing would be brought to light to the court as early as possible. Okay, thank you. Well, Mark Leader, where, what were, where did the problems come from and what would you do to prevent and they're still going wrong. Uh, firstly, the cases are not properly screened. They are not screened at the outset to determine whether police officers uh, engaged in constitutional Whether these accounts of what happened are credible and the results go on and on throughout the system and they're never corrected. The other thing that went wrong and is still going wrong is this try cases at all costs mentality. If you want to get promoted, you will try cases. You will get your stats up, even if a fair and equitable disposition would result in somebody getting a plea offer that addresses what drove the criminal conduct and win at all costs. That's the biggest problem. Problem. It was happening then, unfortunately, it's still happening now, and the beauty of being a prosecutor is that we are trying to seek justice. It is not that we are trying to win at all costs. That culture has got to be changed, and it's got to start now. Okay. Mama <laughs> Jumal. Well, first of all, I am very happy that when Ken and I were carving out the vision for Brooklyn, we talked about the importance of a conviction review unit. Now, under my administration, I would create and enhance that unit. But the most important piece of this is creating and supporting a statewide independent commission that would review the conduct of the lawyers, yes, prosecutors and detectives, NYPD, who were a part of those wrongful convictions. To date, we've had 23 wrongful convictions coming out of Brooklyn. Out of the 23, 21 of them are black and brown men. Now, what, it's wonderful that they have been exonerated, and it's wonderful that they've even gotten some money as a result of it, but no one can ever give them that sense of justice that is so well deserved. So I believe very strongly that you have to hold the system accountable. We can't be afraid to do that, because when we do that, and we do it in a transparent way, so the community understands, and all of us begin to understand what happened, and this way we can ensure it won't happen again. So this is critical, Brooklyn. We have to hold the criminal justice system accountable, and I will do so, because justice matters. Okay. Eric Gonzalez. Our conviction review unit is the national model of how you go back and you take a look at whether or not justice had been fairly applied. You know, out of these 23 convictions, 18 of them happened even before I became a prosecutor. So we know that these cases are 20 and 30 years old. Um, but the important part of the Conviction Review Unit is to make sure that we get every single man and woman who's been wrongfully convicted out of prison. Then the second prong of that is to see what went wrong. And Amma speaks about transparency, but what we're looking for in the system is to examine what went wrong, who's responsible, and why these things happen. And what we found in Brooklyn um, is that systemic problems in the system led to many of these wrongful convictions. And when we go to court and we vacate these convictions, we're very transparent, we name names, we say what went wrong, and I think that is an important component. But Finally, and probably as importantly as anything else, is making sure these never happen again. And we do that by making sure we're training assistant DAs, that we've learned the lessons that went wrong, and that we're exporting the that this national model across the country. To date, to date, no one has been held accountable. To date, nobody has been held accountable for those wrongful convictions. And that's a problem. I get it. We're, I'm glad that we have a robust unit going on at the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. But what's more important, 
important is that people are held accountable for what went on. We've got to be able to investigate and review what people have done. When you say held accountable, are you talking about um, disciplinary charges? Are you if talking that, about criminal charges? What are you talking about? If that is so warranted. Mm -hmm. I believe that people have to be able to be reviewed. That work, what led? When somebody has spent over 20 years in jail for a crime they haven't committed, it's wonderful that they've been exonerated. That's the first step. But the second step has to be accountability. We've got to be afraid. We can't be afraid to review the work of the prosecutors in the criminal justice system. There are still prosecutors still in the DA's office, even though they may have happened years ago. The work of lawyers, that matters. It does matter. I know Mr. Gentile wants to get in here. And How can I respond to this? Yes. Because it's very clear. Transparency and accountability is happening with this process. What Amr is speaking about is punishment. And those are politically motivated attacks. Maybe they're a little bit naive, but we all lawyers up here, we all know that the statute of limitations has run on cases 20 and 30 years ago. That's why the national groups, the innocence projects, the defense attorneys, and the people who do this work still say that the work coming out of Brooklyn is the national model. And let, let's not be mistaken. There's not a wrongful conviction problem that's exclusive to Brooklyn. It's a national problem. The difference is that in Brooklyn, we took actions to that's correct it. That's not true, though. If you're, if, you're an attorney, if you're an attorney, that there's no statute of limitations with regard to your practice of law. Exactly. And integrity is all an attorney has. Exactly. And I sit on boards and we review attorney conduct and I'm telling you that they ought to be disbarred if there was intentional <laughs> misconduct. And I've been talking about that since the beginning. We don't need them to practice law anywhere. Let me, let, let, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. I mean, let, me do a, let me do a little uh, traffic management here. <laughs> Vinnie Gentile wanted to get in on this. Let me, let me get in here as, uh, as the outsider having been and a Queens prosecutor, uh, we, uh, we, we look at, at what is going on in, in uh, Brooklyn, and I've got to say, the worst thing you can say about a prosecutor's office is they're having wrongful convictions after wrongful convictions after wrongful convictions. That's happening in Brooklyn. That's the Brooklyn reputation, and that's why we have to bring in a new, a new era of ethics and professionalism, and that's what we'll do. That's what we'll do. I, I, I want to I make sure we hear from, from Ann Zwern, who was a senior prosecutor yes, in this office. And, and, and the retaining of attorneys that have committed these wrongful convictions in the office still perpetuates that behavior. They're the ones training. They're the ones that are supervised. They're the ones who get paid more money. What does that say to the public? What does that say to the attorneys in the office? What does it say to the wrongfully convicted? That we reward them for their bad behavior. So they do need to be held accountable at all levels. If they haven't committed a criminal act, they shouldn't be prosecuted. If they've committed an ethical violation, they should be referred to the Grievance Committee. And if all fails, they should be fired from the office if they've been engaged in a wrongful conviction. And that's what's, and that's what's, that's what's happened in Brooklyn. Me. Excuse me. And this, when the acting DA says that I'm naive for this, this whole panel is in agreement that accountability is critical. You still have prosecutors there who are part of those wrongful conviction cases. You have to hold people accountable. What, what, what is he so scared of? There's not a single problem. Prosecutor in the office he gets a that has been held held accountable for a, a mis intentional misconduct is what we're talking about, right? So we know that there's not a single person. And let me let me just say this in addition to this: this is not a situation that was not known in 2012 and 2013. So to sit here and say that something did not happen today that did not happen years ago when these wrongful convictions were first being discovered is. It's just political. Mark, Mark Fleener wanted to ask. I agree with Eric about one thing, which is not always the case between the two of us, but here's the point. It is a national problem. Why in heaven's name isn't Brooklyn the third largest office in the country with this extra extraordinary media exposure and this great progressive energy to do things fairly and justly? Why are we not setting the national standard? The only way that the national standard can be set, I believe, is if there is an independent review of these, because as as Eric pointed out, there are political implications to all of these decisions, and sometimes they can be uh, abused. So that an independent investigation needs to take place where this happens, and an independent force needs to take action. But in the meantime, let's get it right during the trials. Okay, thank you all for a spirited discussion on a very important topic. We're going to go now to our panel, and we begin with Janine Ramirez. Janine. Okay, Vincent Gentile, this is for you. As a member of the city council, 
You voted in favor of the Criminal Justice Reform Act, which allows offenses like urinating in public, drinking alcoholic beverages on your stoop, dumping garbage on the sidewalk to be treated as civil offenses rather than criminal acts. But the police can still pursue criminal charges if they think they're appropriate. So as DA, if police hand you one of these cases as criminal, would you prosecute? We would give, the, uh, that's why we gave the police that discretion, and certainly it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. The presumption would be that it should be a civil penalty. Someone will have to pay a penalty, but it will not, it will not be a criminal summons, be a civil penalty. And we did that in the city council to give some youngsters hope. If they make a mistake, uh, a one-time mistake, uh, a, a first-time low-level offense like you mentioned, um, that they will pay a penalty or do community service, but they will not have a criminal record hung around their neck for years to come. That was the purpose of the Criminal Justice Reform Act that I supported and I voted for. However, we do have that discretion, and the police office, uh, police have that discretion to uh, bring the case to the district attorney. If that happens, then I will evaluate the circumstances uh, with the presumption that it really should, in the first instance, be a civil uh, civil penalty. And er <laughs> Eric Ole at Manhattan DA's office, uh, DA Vance, uh, jumping the turnstile and the fair beating, he is not even prosecuting this kind of stuff. How about what's happening in the, as acting DA in your office? You saw after uh, DA Vance uh, made his announcement, I jumped in and said I applauded him because I knew that there would be a lot of criticism of doing that. People are so afraid that if we don't have every possible tool in law enforcement that we'll go back to the bad old days. But it's something that I believe very firmly in, Janine, that we can keep the people of Brooklyn safe and the city safe while not um, enforcing broken windows cases. So in Brooklyn, I've made a commitment to stop prosecuting fair evasion cases. Um, there are going to be some of these cases that will come into the system as people have warrants or other issues. But a simple young person who can't afford to pay the subway fare and they jump the turnstile, I don't believe that that case needs to come before me. And Patrick, uh, uh, Gatling, sh uh, should a p police officer come to you and say there was a fair amount of marijuana possessed uh, out in public, what would you do? I'm going to say we're not prosecuting it. First of all, New Jersey's going to legalize it. The new governor, the guy that's going to be appointed, the, elected the new governor, you're going to have legal marijuana in New Jersey. It'll be legalized. So now I'm going to cr criminalize people in Brooklyn who, who have marijuana? Absolutely not. We're not going to prosecute marijuana cases in Brooklyn. Okay. Answer. Well, I would not prosecute marijuana cases. Currently, there's a bifurcated system in Brooklyn where you possess marijuana, you don't get prosecuted, but if you're smoking marijuana, you do. And when you look to the communities where that happens, it's East New York, it's Brownsville, it's not Park Slope, and it's not Brooklyn Heights. So first, I would look at the disproportionate contact, people of color on any of these policies, especially when they come to low-level summonses. And I would not keep them in the criminal courts, and I wouldn't necessarily refer them to a civil system, if a child can't pay $2.75 to go into the subway system, can he pay $100 in a civil system? So you can't just send these cases to another system and expect them to do a better job if the, if the overall arching concern is criminalizing poverty and also disproportionately affecting people of color in certain communities differently than other communities. And that is why, that's exactly why we gave the option in civil penalties to do community service service and not if you cannot pay the fine. That's the whole purpose of the option to do community service. And and let me just say, with possession of drugs, exactly. I think there has to be some evaluation. If there is an indicia of an intent to sell, then that changes the story of whether or not they, they should be prosecuted, and I say they should. Bottom line is like that the these low-level crimes, I haven't had an opportunity to address this. Um, the bottom line that these low-level crimes impact uh, the people of color, black and brown people, far greater than any other people. So the problem is, is this. What you have is, this is all the result of the broken windows theory and, and belief. That if you, if, you, if, you process, if you arrest people for these matters, then you're going to stop bigger crime. The issue is this. 
It's unfair to people of color. These are quality of life issues that should not end up for pe young people ending up in jail. That's a huge problem. Whether you want to do civil liability, whatever you want, the bottom line is that people of color are being impacted by all of these crimes so unfairly across the borough. Because you see, it does matter what zip code you live in. Because in Brooklyn, unfortunately, there are two standards of justice, depending on where you live in Brooklyn, and that's a problem. And that's why justice has to matter to all of us. Yes. And Mark, should it be yes. discretion of the prosecutor? Uh, yeah, I, I am passionate about ending broken windows prosecutions. There are three categories that concern me tremendously that criminalize conduct that a humane society should not criminalize. One of them is anything that disproportionately impacts on any particular color of uh, culture, and people of color are always been slammed in this regard. It's outrageous. The second is crimes, or what we're calling crimes, that really go to public health issues, like the possession of a syringe, for example, with some somebody who was in the process, they were encouraging to get off of drugs and things like that, substance abuse issues. And the third one is what I refer to as survival crimes, which absolutely punish people for being poor, urinating in public if they are homeless, turnstile offenses if they are not able to, to, to make the money. If we are criminalizing people for poverty, it is inconsistent with all progressive values, and it's, it's inconsistent with the humane treatment of the members of our community. And Janine, this is why we took the lead in Brooklyn, right? Because five years ago, there were over 17,000 marijuana arrests in Brooklyn. You know, this year, we're under 4,000 arrests, and we're getting better. And we do have cases that come into the system because people who get arrested have warrants or have other criminal uh, offenses attached to it. But only about 1,500 people so far in Brooklyn have been arrested for marijuana possession and put through the system. We've led the way, we'll continue to lead the way, and I believe that number will decrease as we uh, continue forward in our policies. But we've, we did not only just lead the way in Brooklyn, because of the policy that was started here, the rest of the city joined. And joined I think, well, think of how disingenuous this is about the issue of warrants. Let's talk and, about warrants. They dismissed 10-year-old warrants and there are still warrants that people are being held in. So if you keep a case that has a warrant attached to it for low-level marijuanas, and the warrant was issued because of a low-level summons that's 10 years old that you dismissed recently, but if it's 9 years old, it's still attached to your marijuana case, that person stays overnight in jail, that person is at risk at setting bail because of the warrant, and that person is further criminalized for his po 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 poverty. And that's why that's unfair, and that's why it's inconsistent well, the, and name, critical. The problem with that is that person is going to Held. Eric, that person is going to be held it's a anyway tough on the warrant. It's a tough <laughs> Lawyers. But it, it, if we don't prosecute it at all, we're not going to have this problem. And that'll impact also on our undocumented immigrants. Marijuana should not be prosecuted in the state of New York, period, end of story. Okay, Eric, finish what you're saying. I'm not in disagreement with Pat on this issue. What I'm saying is these cases are coming in through the system anyway because the underlying person is being arrested on a warrant. So they're coming in anyway. The people who come in without any kind of warrants are given DATs or we decline to prosecute them in Brooklyn. We, we decline to prosecute 18% of the cases that come into Brooklyn where there's a marijuana arrest. In comparison, the next highest borough is the Bronx. At, about almost 7%, 6% and change, and I think Manhattan and, and Staten Island, like about 2%. So we're, we're continuing to lead the way in making sure that people are treated fairly, and I am very concerned about racial disparities, and so I'm going to continue to do my job and make sure that we change this. But are you, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, though. Before, before, we, before we even move forward from this, the, the bottom line is this. When you were the head of the green <laughs> zone, what did you do? You didn't do anything to address the stop and frisk issues. You didn't do anything to address all of these matters. Now that you're running for district attorney and after really riding on Ken's coattails, now you want to talk the talk. <laughs> I mean, I really want to know. Let's keep it real here. Okay, let's keep it real. Because it matters. It matters. Uh, Alma, listen. This is quite simple. You take claim to helping him run for office. If you were as valuable and instrumental as possible, you would have been the chief assistant. Not I. And he would have, and he would have appointed you acting district attorney. You've overstated your case. 
I've taken, I've taken the lead with Ken to try to make our criminal justice system as fair as possible. And I'm the only person on this stage that spent their entire life in a low-income minority neighborhood, black and Hispanic neighborhood my entire life. I, I'm concerned about these issues because it's the reason why I became a prosecutor in the first place. Yeah, what did you, you do? What did you do when you had an opportunity? I know you didn't live in New York. Here, 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 here. Hold up. Hold up here right hold on, now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Now, hold on, hold on, Eric hold on, hold on. Gonzalez, you know darn well, because we've had this conversation numerous times. My mother died the week before the primary. She was up here. We were running for office for Ken. We were pushing him in the last bit of this. I lost my father in the beginning of the year, and then I lost my mother. So for you to sit here and to impugn my character by saying something along the lines of what you're saying is really outrageous. Shame yeah. on you. But more importantly, Amma, no, the, when you were in the problem, green zone, Amma, you the were problem in the office is for 20 the, years. You, when you, you were in the office the for 20 office years. You left the office under a cloud. I left, you the, left the office, office because, under because, a cloud. I left the office. Because that's, I, why, that's why Ken could not give you a position. I, actually, I left the office because I disagreed with the way Joe Hines was handling the cases and things that were going on. And that truth wasn't and trust wasn't a, par uh, a priority. You stayed. You stayed and you continued. And you and really, when we spoke about you, we thought that it was going to be a good idea for you to be Ken's number two person. But you know what? You know what? Sadly to say, the, the biggest concern I have is that whether or not you would have the backbone to, in order to make sure you don't go back to the Heinz administration. Because right. that's well, the problem. Can we get back to the matters that, the, the matters that matter to these people, the Brooklyn voters? I'm just gonna, I just have to respond yeah, to this yeah, last Yeah, let, let Eric piece. respond. And, and we'll move on. Go. I, I'm a, as a person, I think you're a good person, but you left the office because of the issues you had. The woman sitting next to you, Anne Swern, was part of the investigation. You were demoted. And you, and you were suspended, and you resigned. That's why you left. Actually, let's get it straight, and I'm glad you brought it up, because it's very important about truth. Now, the bottom line was this. I left the district attorney's office because of the actions of a young lawyer and what they, did, what they didn't do. They didn't tell the truth. Now, you knew about that, Eric, because the whole office knew about it. And yeah, Ann Swearing, she was a part of that inquisition. Bottom line is, is that I left the office because I would not withstand upholding telling lies. Now, you have no problem under that administration staying there and allowing for, because that, okay. the prosecutor yeah. lies, that leads okay. to the Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. We're, we're, we're covering old ground now. Um, you, Ann Zwern's name was mentioned. You can get a brief response, and then we're going to move on to the next topic. And now that it was brought up by them, it was an investigation. 23 members of her staff were spoken to, to a person. They said she was an abusive boss, that she yelled and screamed at them, and that she was not not available. If she wasn't there to yell and scream at them, she was not available to answer their questions. When asked for her timesheets, she didn't have those timesheets. She couldn't reconstruct the timesheets. And in fact, and in fact, did not substantiate that she was in the office available to her staff. It was not, it was an inquiry that Lance Ogis okay. and also Carol Moran investigated, and we gave the findings to the executive staff of the DA's office. If I may, we, this is really important, because let me say one thing. Rip, rip. Really quick, please. I didn't do anything improper. I left the district attorney's office with 23 days on the books. And that's what the bottom line is. And I will say this much. During that course of time, and Errol, I have to applaud you, because in the Daily News at that time, did an op-ed piece. Because what was very clear on what was going on, this is all about the wrongful conviction, and this is all about what people like Ann and other people hid. There was an issue with Jabbar Collins, and they were in the middle of fighting the fight. Joe Hines and Mike Vecchione were trying to make Joe, uh, keep uh, Jabbar Collins in, in jail. Jo the Judge Irizarry in the federal court was really trying to do what was right. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, and the Daily News wrote an op-ed piece about okay. this. And they wrote an op-ed piece about this saying, we what's can't, going on? I'm sorry, the we can't. The bottom line is, I didn't do anything improper. Okay. And everything changed for me when I went against <laughs> Joe Hines. And you see, his lynchment, okay. they still exist. We're going we're gonna to leave some of this to the... We're going to leave some of this... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We're going to leave some of this to the fact-checkers and the New York Law Journal and the, the reporters who will pick up some of this. But we've got to move on. There's another important pressing topic that Juan Manuel Benitez is going to bring up. Thank you, Errol. 
Today, the Trump administration announced the end of DACA, a federal program that gave many undocumented immigrants who came to the U.S. as children a temporary status and a job permit. If they now come into contact with law enforcement, they can potentially face deportation. Mr. Gonzalez, how will you handle uh, cases in which current and former DACA recipients are involved? Well, what happened today was a travesty. It's un-American. And to think that people who have been promised a better life in this country, who came here for a better life and were brought here as children to be thought that they would be sent to a country they barely know is unconscionable. Very simply, I created an immigration affairs unit in my office with immigration attorneys to make sure the people of Brooklyn understood that they would have fairness in their criminal justice system. And I'm going to stand up for immigrants in the criminal justice system. I'm going to make sure that whenever possible that the plea recommendations and the sentences take into consideration collateral consequences in immigration. And for the dreamers, um, I'm going to protect them. I'm going to make sure that nothing that I do is going to hurt them and make sure that they get deported. Would you be more specific? What will you do to protect them? Sure. Well, when, we, when they, if, if they come in, we're going to work very carefully with their attorneys um, to make sure, because we won't necessarily know someone's immigration status. We're going to work very closely with their attorneys to figure out immigration neutral consequences or and pleas. And if, if necessary, and it's been done before, we won't prosecute some of these cases. Ms. Gatlin. Well, you know, when I was the Human Rights Commissioner, and I, I told there's no such thing as an illegal person. We are all human beings, and, you know, in this document, it, it kind of boggles my mind, and I'm still trying to wrap my mind around, you know, what's going on in the citizen versus non-citizen. I think that if we treat all people equally and fairly, if we do away with the kinds of crimes that we know that they're getting ensnared in that are preventing undocumented immigrants from ever becoming citizens, like marijuana, mm -hmm. small controlled substances, you know, the, the kinds of crimes that actually can be revisited, that we can replead. You know, we need to not only look at the people going forward, but the people who are caught up in this looking backwards. And so I would say I would set up an immigration law review board, and that board would be uh, the attorneys who are with the American Association of Immigration Lawyers and people who really understand what they're doing. And we're going to revisit cases from 2018 backwards in terms of those who have these convictions for these marijuana cases and cases that prevent them from ever applying for citizenship. And that's about 25% okay. Mr. Mr. Gentile, immigrants. what would you do? Well, I think one of the things we can do, we don't have to wait for the federal government. I think the state government can take a step uh, to, to help in this regard by changing the law for the maximum amount of time for a misdemeanor uh, and changing it by one day, from uh, changing it from 365 the question, days. The question is more uh, in the lines of how can you, can you guarantee uh, these immigrants, if they come in contact with law enforcement, Okay. that you won't be prosecuting those cases in a way that will put them potentially on a path to deportation? Sure. I, again, it has to be on an individual. We would evaluate each individual basis, but the presumption would be that we would not. But I think the state has to take a, a stand here and change the law for everybody, not just for, for um, DACA students, not just for those who are immigrants, but for everybody. Because uh, uh, having a misdemeanor of a year or more will implicate immigration holds. So if we change the law in the state of New York from a misdemeanor from 365 days to 364 mm -hmm. days, for everybody, that will uh, recognize the consequences, uh, uh, the disparate consequences for uh, immigrants. Let me add one more detail, Ms. Hearn, because the New York Attorney General announced uh, today that he will sue the federal government over, over this issue. Would you join that kind of lawsuit, and in what grounds? Um, I would join it, and I would support it with facts, because we are the front line of what's really happening to our immigrant neighbors. And so they need the, the cases. They need the instances so that they can bring it in the lawsuit. So I would join hand in hand with Eric Schneiderman and anybody who wants to fight it. But some of the facts were, were apparent to us long ago. Um, years ago, I met a young man on the street, and he was applying to law school. And he wanted an internship at the Brooklyn DA's office, knowing that he was a, a, a young person 
person who brought, was brought to this country by his parents. He knew that he faced a challenge going to law school whether he would get admitted to the bar because he wasn't a citizen. And in fact, for years he fought and fought with the bar. And finally, when DACA was approved, he was admitted to the bar. I am so fearful for him now that something's going to happen to him and he's going to be dragged out of his law office or dragged out of a courtroom because he's a member, he was a, eligible under DACA. And now what's the Bar Association going to do? It's a terrible thing. The facts on the ground matter. And I will work hand in hand with Eric Schneiderman and anybody else who wants to refute these terrible Trump policies. Mr. So Friedner. Thank you. What President Trump attempted to set in motion today made me sick to my stomach. I wanted to be on the picket lines, but I had an appointment with you all. Here's the deal. There are things that we need to do, that we frontline people need to do to make sure that ICE and others that would impact adversely on the immigration status of individuals happen before they get to court. And when I talk about an early, careful screening process, I mean before there are charges put in place and before there's an arraignment and before they get to criminal court where somebody can, can stop them and, and detain them. And that's why the early screening done by not only appropriately senior and well-trained assistant district attorneys, but a social services person who can spot these issues. And here's a concept. Let's not be in an adversarial position with the, the uh, legal aid attorney or the Brooklyn Defender Service person from the minute we get into court. Let's say we have a meeting of the minds on what a sanctuary city is, on what justice is, and let's try and solve this problem together instead of reverting to opposite corners and doing battle. Ms. Jumeau. Yeah. My father was from Ghana, West Africa. And being a product of an immigrant family, I understand what it means to be in fear. I know what it means when you don't fit in because of who you are and your last name or where you come from. That cannot exist in Brooklyn. And so one of the most important things in all of this is that the immigrants, no matter who you are, if you are a resident of Brooklyn, you should be afforded the free legal services across the board. It shouldn't depend on your status, whether you're an immigrant or not. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to what is the thing that you can do to help, you've got to be able to give people free legal services. Now, in order to- But you don't have a say on that. Do you? Well, not right now, I don't. And that's right. the thing. When we had an opportunity to stand and advocate for free legal services mm -hmm. for the residents of Brooklyn, our acting DA was silent. And that's a problem. That's Okay, so what, so what is critical in all of this is this, that the people, you, I'm going to have satellite offices throughout Brooklyn, because oftentimes people are afraid to come down to the district attorney's offices for resources, for assistance, for help. And if I have that in the community, then they're going to have access in order to get their questions answered. Because really, it's more than just keeping a safe haven down at 350 J Street, but it's being a part of the community with free legal services. Okay. On this issue, really quickly, Mr. To... Gonzalez, yeah, and you can, you can respond, um, you can answer too. But will you be ready to defy federal law over this issue? Yes, and what I've done in Brooklyn is I've gone around this county. We've had eight immigration forums throughout different parts of the city, different immigrant communities to let them know that the Brooklyn DA, that I care about protecting them from not only crime, when they are a witness or a victim of crime, but when someone is accused of a crime, that they be treated with fundamental fairness in our criminal justice system. And I've spoken up, I had a press conference with Eric Schneiderman to ask that ICE be prevented from coming into our courtroom and treat the courtrooms like sensitive locations. I've stood up and I've advocated for people in immigration custody like William Hurtado, who was, in my opinion, a hero, a guy who testified and had been put in custody. So I've been on the forefront of this immigration issue, and I believe what I've started in Brooklyn will be the national model. Juan, it's very important, very important in this issue. I'm the only person who actually was managing counsel at the public defender, and we all know that public defenders have the most amount of information about their clients, especially about their immigration status. If they don't have a relationship with the district attorney, they will. we will never get past this issue. It's the working with the, the collaboration with the public defender, and since I'm the only person who actually managed that office, I'm the only person who actually worked there. I have the best relationship with them and the most open door policy to get the information in a way that's trustworthy and that will serve the goals of Brooklyn's safety and also that Brooklyn's immigrant neighbors. That
that they will be treated with respect. The DA's office can never know all the facts of the person. It's the defense attorney that knows the confidential information about the individual we're talking about. Before, before I move on, a show of hands, how many of you will, defy, will be re ready to defy uh, federal law 100. over this issue? If, if I can have like a show of hands. Okay. Okay, Every, everybody except uh, Mr. Gentile. Thank you. That's it. All okay. Right. Thank you, Juan. Uh, it's time now for our lightning round in which answers must either come in the form of a yes or a no or be brief uh, in response. Um, yes and no, this group? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with you, Pat Gatling. <laughs> yeah, you do. Well, we'll, we'll, co we'll go right down the, the list, uh, right down the row on this. Have you ever been the victim of a crime? Yes. 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 A robbery, yes. Oh, boy. Um, let's, uh, Brooklyn, right? <laughs> let's, um... It was a long time ago. It was 1983. <laughs> See? I let's find you. out. Um, do, you, do you use mass transit to get to work? All, well, not to get to work, but I use it all the time. I walk to work. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Uh, I use it in conjunction. Yes. Yeah, I, I get to City Hall and then I drive, and then I, then I use Don't the judge the answer, we're just asking questions. And I questions. use the subway, yes. yes. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yes, and I will when I'm DA. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I have a Metro card. <laughs> okay. Um, I can we'll, prove it. We'll start with Pat and come down, back down the road. Where did you go on your last vacation? Gosh, where did I go? Oh, Ireland. Hmm. Oh my goodness, it's been a long time. Um... <laughs> Kate May. Mm -hmm. I took my three sons to Disney World. It's been about four years, but I think it was Florida. Mm -hmm. Back to the reservation in South Dakota. Uh -huh. I did business and pleasure, and I went to Wyoming. Okay. <laughs> um, have you ever been a defendant in a criminal or civil lawsuit? Um, no. No. Well, uh, currently, yes. Yes. <laughs> No. 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 Actually, yes, as human rights commissioner, but it was dismissed. They sued the city, yes. <laughs> um, for anyone here, are you fluent in another language besides English? If so, which one or ones? Me? Moi? Je parle français. Ah, très bien. No, it's Votre? one of my biggest regrets in life. Uh huh. Not as fluent as I should be. I speak a little Spanish. A little Italian. A little Italian. A little Spanish, a little Chui, and a little Dakota. Uh -huh. A little Yiddish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a pistol. <laughs> we'll, we'll go right back down the line. Is it ever appropriate to refer abuse allegations to local religious courts for punishment? Oh, uh, no. 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 <laughs> Absolutely not. No. 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 Um, in your opinion, have the changes at Atlantic Yards been good for Brooklyn, Pat? Yes or no? <laughs> That's that yes and no thing. I'm concerned about gentrification, but yes, the Atlantic Yards is good. Mm -hmm. No. no. Yes. I think the jury's still out. Hmm. It's been good. I love the Nets, but no. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever used an illegal drug? I've smoked marijuana. <laughs> I've smoked marijuana. Yes, you've asked me that question before. Yes. <laughs> no. College. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at the risk of starting controversy, what is the best pizza in Brooklyn? Please be specific. Oh, my God. I don't even know the name of the place. There was a guy on Court Street who I used to get it from. I stopped eating pizza. Oh, <laughs> tragic. The one that's 99 cents and you get a free Coke or something. That's the one on Court Street. <laughs> oh, on Willoughby Street. Street. Yeah, I know where that is. Yeah. <laughs> from my high school days, and I still love it, Spumoni Gardens. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, okay, there you go. Now, I would have picked that, but since he did, I'll pick, to, I'll pick to Tono's. And the Tonos. The Tonos, yeah. Okay. I like Spumoni Gardens as well, but I also like Patsy's Pizza. Ah. And downtown, I like Juliana's, which was the original Patsy's, and then they got bought out, and now, but I stick with Pat and Carol all the way. There you go. Um, what is the last book that you read? I reread The Handmaid's Tale. Oh. Hmm, that's interesting. 
Um, it, oh my gosh, the title's escaping me, but it was in preparation for running for office. Um, oh my gosh. Wait, can you come back? It, it'll come to okay. me. Okay, I'm sorry. Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Locked in. I just reread Ta Nehisi Coates Between the World and Me. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Book. I actually just reread that also. <laughs> okay. Last chance. Yeah, you know, it was it, it was about the it was about um, Hillary Clinton and her running for office. Uh huh. So I, I, it was one oh, okay. of those books. Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, have you ever used a city bike? No. 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 No bikers. <laughs> okay. No, I ride a bike, just not a city bike. <laughs> ah, okay, very good. Um, thank you, candidates. We're going to move on now to our cross-examination. That's when each candidate gets to uh, ask one of his or her opponents a question. Ms. Wern, because of the coin toss or the random process we went through, I should say, we'll start with your question for anyone up here. Eric. <laughs> you returned the money from the bail industry that you got um, in your campaign. You did not return the money that they raised for you in this campaign. Was that the reason, or is that the reason that there's confusion about what you say to the audiences when you're told about your groundbreaking revision of a, a bail policy and the difference of what's going on actually in the courts today where people are still, your, your assistants are still asking for bail on low-level cases like shoplifting cases, like some of the street, you know, the low-level street crime okay. cases. Is the change or the, the change of your position from the public to what's going on in the courtroom or as a result of your support by the bail industry? Thank you for the question, Ed. Um, I'm very proud of the bail policies that I've put in place in Brooklyn. I think they're groundbreaking. The overwhelming majority of cases, 90% um, of the people who come before a criminal court judge on a misdemeanor are released on, without any bail. I think that we've come a long way. That was always the case. Well, well, let it, it, it wasn't the case. And in fact, the citywide average is closer to 20%. But. Uh, I'm very proud of it. I took some money from the bail industry, which you know I've returned. It's less than half of 1% of the money I raised. I returned the money because it became a distraction. But my bail policy reform that I put in place came before that. I'm, con I'm committed to bail reform, and I'm committed to making sure that we end poor people's bail. No one should be in, ba in prison or in Rikers Island because they can't afford bail. Okay. It's only question and answer, not dialogue just yet. Ms. Jumal. Eric, my question for you. <laughs> my question for you. It, it goes back to the wrongful convictions, okay? And there have been more cases where Detective Scarcella has been cited for possible misconduct, possible criminality, and are you going to investigate Detective Scarcella? Now, there is an opportunity to, to uh, prosecute if the facts bear it out for the crime of perjury in his most recent cases. Mm -hmm. So would you investigate and would you prosecute? We have about 30 more cases involving uh, Detective Scarcella that we need to get through. We've looked at over 70 of his cases. In eight of them, we've made a decision to vacate those convictions. And so, obviously, I'm very concerned about what we've learned in these cases. I believe that um, currently under state law, a prosecution of Detective Scarcella is not possible. I do support uh, making uh, additional inquiries to see whether or not some of our federal uh, law enforcement partners may have a different ability to do the work that, uh, unfortunately, our state law does not allow. Would you investigate him then? There's, it's an ongoing investigation. And I should also say, in the very last case, Jabbar Washington, which I asked the court to vacate and we dismissed the indictment, I was very clear in the conduct that I thought was um, wrong that led to that wrongful conviction, including an issue of you know, not turning over Brady material, but also misleading testimony by Detective Scarcella. So would you okay, investigate? Okay, uh, nope, Okay. Next is Mr. Gentile. Uh, Eric. Um, <laughs> it's not even my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, Eric, you use uh, Ken Thompson as a shield quite often, but the fact is that you have spent almost 19 years 
working under Charles Hines. And within that time, the, the, we have found, the public, myself included, has found since Ken took over, that there were very systemic problems happening Question. in the DA's office during those, the, those times. Now, Ken tried to, to fix it, but my question to you, Eric, is where were you? Where were you during those 19 years where all these systemic things were happening in the Brooklyn DA's office? And you were silent got it, got for 19 it. years. Got the question. We got the question. Let's get the answer. So I'm very proud of the career that I've had. I came into this job to help victims get justice, to make the community better. I was a trial assistant in various bureaus, sex crimes, um, domestic violence, and then in the trial bureau. In 2011, I was promoted to chief of the Green Zone. And when these wrongful conviction matters became public, I made sure the 40 lawyers that worked for me um, were trained and that I was very careful to make sure that none of these wrongful convictions were coming out of the unit that I was responsible for. But I was never in an executive leadership role, in a policy role. But I think Ken Thompson himself had to trust that I was the prosecutor best suited to help him right the ship, and that's what happened. Wait, we're, we're talking about 19... No, no, Mr. At least Gisela, Omer no, quit. No, no, no. It's, just, it's, Omer just, quit. it's just question and answer. Um, actually, Eric gets to ask a question himself. Oh. <laughs> you gonna <laughs> dance. So I'll ask my question to Ann. And I've heard you during the course of the campaign talk about ending broken windows policing and changing the bail policies. Um, and including him not asking for bail on any misdemeanor cases. During my, our career in the office, I saw that you, know, you were the head of criminal court and you were in the executive leadership role. You were the first assistant district attorney. How can you reconcile the promises you're making now when you had the ability to put a lot of those changes in place in the position you were in for over 20 years? When Eric, when Eric actually talks about 90% of the people were released in Brooklyn for, for bail all that time, that was my policy, 90%. But we have to push the envelope further if we're going to close Rikers Island, if we're going to end reliance on cash bail. And we have to go further in that. And that's why we have, thank God, we have now supervised release. Thank God right now we have the community bail fund. We didn't have those things back then. But what I see happening in court now is assistant DAs will ask for $2,500 bail. You know why that's a significant number? Because the community bail fund is limited at $2,000. So there's still things that are going on in that courthouse today that because I worked at Brooklyn Defenders, because I worked at the, at the Public Defenders Office, I know what's going on in that courthouse today. Every case, every policy, every victim, every defendant deserves justice. And we rely too much on cash bail and that criminalizes poverty. That's the problem with the cash bail system. And I will push the envelope and I'm glad that you asked this question of me, Eric. Okay. Mark Liebner. Yes. I'm going to go, Eric. Um, please address uh, for the viewers uh, your pattern of negligence in each of the four events that I'm going to list. Um, one of them is your failure to pay your taxes for so many years that they put a warrant on you. Number two, um, you're accepting a uh, benefit that was for the elderly in terms of your rent uh, in one of your properties. Number three, your management of a senior assistant district attorney, uh, who, which resulted in her criminally uh, c uh, violating the uh, privacy rights of, I guess, uh, a, an old boyfriend and somebody else by forging judges' signatures over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. And lastly, uh, your failure to recognize the fact that, that taking money from big bail businesses uh, for your campaign donations was fundamentally outrageous. Okay. Okay. That's a four-part question. You can answer all of them or any one of them. All right, so first and foremost, about my integrity, um, it's beyond reproach. Uh, what, happened, <laughs> what happened with the tax issue, I'll start with the tax issue, I think that's the most relevant. Like many families, I incurred credit card consumer debt. And when I was having my third child, I wanted to settle this debt. I got into a settlement agreement with the credit card companies and it caused an unexpected tax 
uh, liability, something at the time I could not afford to pay. I wasn't making the money back then that I'm making now, and so I did the responsible thing. I got into a payment agreement. I voluntarily took care of that. I was given three years to pay it off. I paid it off and over I, sooner than that, and I paid it off over a year ago. The scree benefit you're talking about was a misapplication. It was a bureaucratic blunder by HPD. It had nothing to do with me. When it was brought to my attention, it was resolved. Uh, uh, the uh, the assistant <laughs> district attorney on the wiretap. Yeah. Uh, so, so the. There was a stunning betrayal of a, of a prosecutor, prosecutor you knew very well. She worked directly under you at some point. I supervised her, and she, I, and you know what? I supervised her, and she didn't do that. Please, let him, let him finish. So it was, it was a stunning betrayal, and when I learned about it, it was literally weeks after, you know, Ken had passed away. Um, I... I, I held her accountable. And what I did was we investigated, we determined that in fact she did what we thought she had done. And I called the FBI and made, had her arrested. And I had her sent over to the Eastern District for prosecution. She's pled guilty and she's awaiting sentence. So I've held her accountable. Okay. We'll, we'll pass on the bail question. We've already talked about that. Your turn to um, ask a question has passed, so Pat Gatlin can ask a question. Eric. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eric, I was a bureau chief, and when I was the bureau chief of narcotics, I was able to start a reentry program. I was able to train 3,000 police officers. And so, being a bureau chief, that you can do things. And so, what I want to know from you, and also I did diversity. In fact, I hired you when I was a bureau. That is a true fact. That's a true fact. So, Thank you, Pat. <laughs> I didn't do a bad job. <laughs> but that being said, Eric, I want to know, for 20 years you sat there in the office, what did you do to advance the cause of black and brown people in the criminal justice system? Thank you for the question. As I indicated earlier, the reason I became a prosecutor is to make sure that someone who actually had skin in the game joined it. Because many black and Latino um, attorneys want to be defense attorneys. I believe that if I was inside the system, I could start making fundamental changes. And one of the things about the green zone was that I had a reputation, well-earned reputation for fairness and justice. It's why Ken Thompson chose me to elevate me in the first place, to help him start the policies that he believed would make Brooklyn a fairer place. I'm very proud of all the work I've done. And honestly, from defense attorneys to judges and to a lot of observers in the criminal justice system, the reason why I have so much support for my candidacy is because they saw what I did for 19 years when, before uh, Ken Thompson was elected. And so that's why there's Eric, wide can support. Can you name anything specific that you did? Yes. Other, I, than, other than to let, meet Ken let, and become let, politically connected let, to Ken Thompson. Well, I, I think you is his second, I, not his first. Chief assistant. I think the answer is I gave justice to thousands of cases that I've been involved in. And you know what, Pat? That's what prosecutors do. You know, know what, you know That's what, Pat? what we do. I stayed in the community that I lived in. I stayed. I didn't leave. I stayed there. I made sure that they saw a young Puerto Rican guy wear a suit and tie in a neighborhood that never saw young Puerto Rican men succeed. I've no, no, heard Eric, Eric, please, Eric. Please, I think we, we've got a question. I, gotta, I have to be got a question to and an answer. That, you know, um, Eric, I've been working for 30 years in Brooklyn, and I refuse please. to allow you to, de to demean my community service to my community and to your community and to the Asian community because I've been working on behalf of all people of color for the last okay. 30 years. All right. I don't know that let's, I demeaned you. I just simply said I never left my community. Let, we're we're going to go now to a second round of questions from our panel. Uh, we just passed the 8 o'clock mark. We've got a half hour left. You guys have been pretty good, but please use the lights. We're, we're showing you uh, uh, green, yellow, and red to make sure we stay within <laughs> our, our time. Yeah, that's what the lights are for. Uh, let's get our next question from Janine Ramirez. Uh, in 2014, a rookie cop named Peter Liang was on patrol in a public housing complex in East New York. He entered a dark stairwell with his gun drawn, and it went off, killing 28-year-old Akai Gurley. Mark Fleedner, you were the prosecutor in that case and successfully convicted police officer Liang of manslaughter. At sentencing, D.A. Thompson only recommended probation, and that's what he got. 
If you were DA, what would, you, what would your sentencing recommendation be and why? Well, I think my position on that is, is very clear. It was one of the fundamental reasons why I decided to leave the office, all but not the only one, and start my own civil rights practice. Uh, when uh, the trial team was called together to uh, provide our position on what the sentencing should be, I advocated uh, very clearly and very specifically for why uh, Mr. Uh, Liang, Officer Liang, should be subjected to the same standard of sentencing that any one of us would be subjected to if we had committed the same crime of manslaughter in the second degree. You need to understand that in order to, to uh, hold him uh, to a different standard, you had to actually go to a different section of the penal law and say he's to be treated differently because of some extraordinary circumstances. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez has gone on the record and, and said that part of the reason why he advocated differently was because uh, the police commissioner thought it was a tragic accident. Um, and uh, But why do I feel so strongly about the fact that our sentencing recommendation should have been that he be treated the same as everybody else? Because when we took on that case, when we objectively and carefully investigated it, and when we got an indictment and a conviction when nobody else in the country was doing that, we sent a message to this community that the lives of those that are lost, unarmed, black men, all of these things that we see, we've seen nationally all over the place, that they matter and that the consequences matter. And when we took this stand that was completely different from what the public expected, we pulled the rug out from under them. And the equal justice message was eliminated. Okay, Vincent Gentili, what would you have done? Well, actually, you, you, we don't know what, what uh, Ken Thompson was thinking at the time, so it's hard to uh, imagine what he came up, uh, what his uh, um, thinking was on this. But I, I, I agree, uh, in essence, with Mark. At the end of the day, you have a dead body. And, and, and it may be a tragedy, but it's still a dead body. And you have to um, treat uh, those uh, similarly. And certainly, in, in this case, uh, it shocked me that there was a, 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 a sentence of probation. And Soren, if you're a DA, how do you work alongside police and then also, in some instances, have to prosecute them? I'm so glad you asked that, because in 1989, a police officer killed an unarmed black man on Eastern Parkway. I prosecuted that case. He was convicted, and he served state prison time. Yet I managed to have a career, a very wonderful career, in the DA's office for the next 30 years, dealing with all kinds of cases, dealing with robberies, dealing with rapes, dealing with low-level cases. I supervised the criminal court. Thousands of officers I engaged with on a daily basis and successfully prosecuted cases and successfully deflected cases from the system at well. It's not difficult to actually prosecute a guilty police officer and have a great relationship with the good police officers that do the work. And what is your take on Liang? What's my take on Liang? That I agree that people who commit manslaughter should be held similarly accountable. And the same crime should be the same punishment. Ahmed Jamal. In relation to the... To Pierre Lee, what, what is your take on, on the case, and should he have gone to jail? What I will say is this. I think it's critical to understand in your, in your charging decisions, because I think you have a responsibility as a prosecutor. When you're going to submit charges before a grand jury, you understand the ramifications. Now, at the end of the day, if the ramifications and if, that, if any other person would be held to jail time, then I would hold a similar standard, that any other person be held to jail time. But the key is, what are you charging someone and why are you charging it? Because this, is, this becomes critical because it's an, it, the DA has to be apolitical. And, and when you have an officer who discharges their weapon, the community really has a problem with prosecutors as a family and as law enforcement working together, investigating and handling those cases. That's why under my administration, I would request a special prosecutor, if the attorney general decided to turn it down or did not take action, I would go before a special a, a judge to petition for a special prosecutor. Because it is about the appearance of impropriety. The bottom line is this, whenever you investigate someone, you have to recuse yourself if you know them. And I think that the community at large has a real issue with Prosecutors. So, you, so you would hand it over? You would not prosecute the case? In some, yes. Uh, yes. So Eric? I think it's important to clarify that this was a tragedy 
that this, you know, what happened to Akai Gurley, we all wish it could be taken back, that it had never happened, that um, Officer Liang had not patrolled that stairwell with his finger on the trigger, and the pain that the Gurley family has gone through is unimaginable. To know that they lost their son and their nephew in, in such a... A sh uh, in, in, in such a way that was unnecessary. Then why but did people, you engage them in well, a sentencing I'm recommendation conversation? I'm trying. Why did they have to learn it on the news? Mark, let me, I'm going to get back to my point, but I'll address your point. You were the lead person and the lead person speaking to the family at that, that time. That is correct. So, and I had the mother on the phone a from a military base in Florida waiting to talk to you and Mr. Thompson, and she didn't get to get the, an answer on that telephone call until they heard it on the news. Then why didn't you tell her? Then why didn't you tell her? But anyway, because I was forbidden to. No, no, it was not, a that's, secret. That's Please. Not, that's not true. What, let me just, in, in reference to what Ken was thinking, Ken, Ken understood that what happened here was a crime. What I've said in the past was that many people were willing to excuse what happened uh, as simply as an accident because it was a ricochet. It was not a direct shot into a Kai Gurley. It was a, it was a ricochet that was inadvertent, and by the testimony that we all heard in the courtroom, it was unclear that Peter Liang even knew that a Kai Gurley was in that stairwell. But, but are you all saying that the jury got it wrong? Is that what you all are saying? No, I'm saying the jury got it right that he was patrolling in a way that was unsafe. And that was the reason for the manslaughter charge. We also know that the judge reduced that manslaughter conviction to a criminally negligent homicide. So it was a difficult decision that Ken had to make. He did speak to many members. He prayed on it. He spoke to his pastor. He spoke to leaders. It was the most difficult decision that Ken made. But at the end of, that, at the, end of the day, he made the decision that why you have a district attorney in the first place to make the difficult decisions. He did not believe that justice would be served by putting Peter Liang in prison. And when we talk about how other people have been treated, when we look back and an officer had not been convicted in this city for over 10 years before that, that officer also did not get prison time. But that's not the point. The point is we have many cases in the DA's office where someone is charged with manslaughter and they do not go to prison. There's other, depends on the case. So it was a difficult decision, but it was a decision that Ken made after praying on it, and I do support his decision. Pat. Well, you know, I used to handle those cases also in the special prosecutor's office. And they're very difficult cases to, once you, to even get an indictment. And once you get an indictment, and as they did in this case, and you've given this climate, and you get a conviction, and then you don't, you don't seek a sentence, a jail sentence. You know, we have a saying, you know, the higher the grace, the higher the penalty. And, you know, we hold police officers just like we hold prosecutors in high esteem. And just like with a police officer that commits a crime, unfortunately, he's go he has to be held to a higher standard. Because you're a police officer. You're a law enforcement official. As a prosecutor, I'm held to a higher standard, and I should be held to a higher standard. I can't just do anything. And so what happens happened here was not only a, tra a travesty of justice for the victim and for the victim's family, but for the nation. Brooklyn had an opportunity to be a model of justice, and they failed. And I don't want to hear about praying. I don't want to hear. All I want to hear is, are you a prosecutor or are you a politician? And quite frankly, I think, I think Ken succumbed to the politician. OK, okay. thank you, Janine. Uh, before we go to Juan Manuel Benitez, I want to remind you again of the lights. We're, um, it's live TV, <laughs> so when we're done, we're really done. Um, if you keep the answers uh, uh, quick and crisp, we'll cover a lot more territory. Let's go. Thank you, Errol. In the last six years, three Brooklyn legislators have been sent to prison uh, for corruption in cases brought up by federal prosecutors. Has the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office done enough to target political corruption? What would you do to make that a greater priority in the office, Ms. Hearn? It, it, that needs to be a greater priority in the office, and that's why 
I'm an independent person here in this campaign. I have support. I don't have support from any organization or group that would influence my decision making. So we, I, I'm having a financial crimes office, having a um, office that has thorough investigative ability, and having f license to do that. If I need to work with my federal counterparts, I will work with my federal counterparts, but I will not rely on them, especially in a Trump administration, to rely on my counterparts to do the necessary work that it takes to ferret out political corruption and hold those politicians accountable. The public will never have confidence in a system if we don't hold those politicians accountable in Brooklyn on a daily basis as we see it. Mr. Friedner, do you think the office did enough in the last six years? Why did it take federal prosecutors to put Albany legislators from Brooklyn in jail? Politics, crude politics. Uh, you know, the, the, the unique position that I'm in in this race is that I'm the outsider. I, I don't, nobody, nobody knew me in the Democratic Party. I was just an ADA. I'm doing my business and, I'm, and, I'm, and then I'm a civil rights attorney. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of people with a lot of political connections that have run this office and then people get corrupted by the process. There are people that get special knocks on the door. Well, guess what? Those same people that are knocking on the door because they get special access, if they screw up, then then the person at, behind the DA's door owes them something. I don't know anybody anything. And if somebody is a public official and violates the public trust in any way, I will go after them as hard as I have done with police officers. So Mr. Flinder, if, if an elected official wants to endorse your campaign for uh, Brooklyn DA, you wouldn't, you wouldn't take that endorsement? I, I would absolutely take, I would absolutely be glad to take an endorsement if it came from a place where they understood, don't come knocking at my door. And let me just say that to any politicians who might be out there. <laughs> if I get in, I'd love your endorsement in four years, but don't expect anything from me because you're not going to get it, not if you've committed a crime. Mr. Gonzalez, do you think that you getting so many political endor endorsements from uh, elected officials, do you think that is problematic uh, when you are like uh, in charge of maybe uh, prosecuting uh, political corruption? I don't, and I'll, I'll tell you that I've spent uh, my career outside of politics. Um, you know, many of the people on this stage have been very involved in politics in their life. Um, my first time ever walking into a political club was in April of this year when I went to explain why I was running for district attorney. I don't believe that I owe any politician anything. I agree with Mark that we uh, need to do more in making sure that we ferret out corruption. It's one of the questions that when Citizen Union endorsed me, they said, can we do more? And I said, yes, we can do more. We will do more. And as many of these federal prosecutors are now leaving uh, D.C. And, and, and jumping ship from DOJ, I intend to bring them in to give us the investigative skills that we need to continue doing that work. Ms. Kathleen. Well. I, I did, first of all, the investigative skills have always been in the office. There are many, there are several attorneys there that I, I can think of who, who could have investigated corruption cases. But that being said, you know, I'm a political outsider, you know, and, and Ann is a district leader. And, you know, and, and Alma works for uh, the borough president. And Vincent Gentile was a, how many years were you a, a public official? <laughs> you know, and, and still is. Still is. You know, so I, I think we're on the kind of the same end here, you know, and I think that Eric has become a politician quickly. You know, $1.7 million and all the endorsements in the world make you a politician. And so I think that, um, and that being said, I do think it makes it very difficult for people to go after the political leadership in this county. And I do think there's a lot of corruption in this county. And I think that it has to be ferreted out and investigated. Let me just respond. Let me just respond to the, uh, to the, politician thing. I've received endorsements from organizations that have committed themselves to reforming the criminal justice system, like Vocal New York, like uh, Make the Road, organizations like National Organization of Women. This is not about being a politician. It's about having the support of all of Brooklyn. I'm running to be the district attorney for the entire borough. 
and not playing any of these games. Mr. I, Mr. Gentili. Whether you're in politics or not, if you violate the public trust, you should be prosecuted, and you will be prosecuted in my office. That's the bottom line. Do you think that the current office has well, done a bad job it, at, the, at the prosecuting political corruption? Yeah, I, I, if, if, the, if the skills and, and the staffing are not there, we need to put it there. I, I, I would have to investigate that when I become the DA, and we will put it there. And if, and if we need to get uh, a more interaction with the federal uh, uh, prosecutors, we will do that. We will do that because people who violate the public trust do not deserve to be in office and they deserve to be prosecuted. Mr. Jumo, really quick. Mr. Jumo, really quick. Thank yeah. you. Um, so the bottom line is there has to be an equal standard of justice across the board. And so it, if you are a politician, if you are in law enforcement, if you are a prosecutor, the bottom line is that you're going to be held accountable. Now, the truth of the matter is in political corruption cases, it's far easier to bring those cases by the feds because they have the tools in order to do it. Now, the state can, but we don't have the tools. So it's something that we would have to work with the legislature to equip local prosecutors that ability to bring forth these political corruption cases. Bottom line is, is that as a district attorney, you have to be apolitical. And we do have to question when you have so much financial support. We're not even talking about just endorsements from uh, community groups that are going to hold you accountable. But it's the financial support and that of other elected officials across the board. Because at the end of the day, there will be a time when someone will be knocking at your door because of what they've given you. And I just really want to respond. Yeah that when I was asked by the reform part of the Democratic Party a year ago to serve as district leader, it was to address the ability for voters to have access to the Board of Elections, especially in light of the purge here in Brooklyn. And the reason I said yes to my community and those reformers is because I was a lawyer. Very few people are lawyers to actually realize how difficult the, and how, the, how important the issue of dis, voter disenfranchisement is. And there's the laws that prevent voters from getting to the polls, but there's also the ability. Is it, does it have um, ADA access? Is it available to people with disabilities? Is it close? Do people know where to vote? If this is such a critical issue. We're here talking about an election. And, 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 and so it's not a political thing. It's an access to the poll thing. And I'm proud of that, that reform request for me to serve my community. Thank you, Errol. Okay, thank you, Juan. Um, I've got a question. This will very likely be our final question. We're not doing closing statements, so please, again, let's be, let's be uh, crisp and clear. Um, I'll start with you, Ms. Jumeau. The current policy of the Kings County District Attorney's Office is not to ask for bail in misdemeanor cases, although it leaves a lot of room for discretion, since prosecutors reportedly also use character, criminal history, and the type of offense as a criteria for the use of bail as well. Uh, do you think that runs counter to the principle that bail should only be used to ensure a defendant appears for trial? And if so, what would you do when you encounter cases where there is questionable character, extensive criminal history, and uh, heinous offenses. And we're talking about low-level crimes from yes. misdemeanors? Okay, so when you have low-level crimes and misdemeanors, first and foremost, I'm against cash bail, all right? The, you can have a robust pre-trial supervision program to ensure that people will return to court. The bottom line is that we've got too many young people and too many people on Rikers Island who are awaiting trial or their cases to be adjudicated because of low-level crimes and because the bail has been a fix. If you can't make bail, that means then there are two standards of justice for those who can make money and who have money and those who don't. And that's a problem. So I will not criminalize being poor. But most importantly, though, what you have to do is you, you have to remember what the purpose of bail, and like you said, purpose of bail is to ensure people come back to court. The purpose of bail is not for you to sit in Rikers Island for two years waiting for a case to be adjudicated because you can't make bail. That's the bottom line. So I would, so, so, so I would, I would enhance and I would build up a pretrial supervision so we can get people out so they can await trial in these low-level cases. Okay. I've heard a lot of talk tonight about uh, how bail should be reformed. Yes. Right. So I agree with Ama on this issue that we should continuously make sure that our bail policies are the best that they can be, that our policing policies and our enforcement policies are continuously meeting the challenges of the day. However, in cases where people are arrested, we keep talking about misdemeanors, and I think most of the people on this stage have said that they would not ask for bail on misdemeanor cases. 
The problem with that is that the misdemeanor cases, there are assaults and there's domestic violence and crimes against children and sex crimes. The, the policing strategy and the law enforcement strategy that I'm practicing in my office is to focus in on the drivers of crime. And so when people come in on a low level offense, we have to pay attention to those cases. We have to vigorously investigate them and prosecute them. That's why 2016 has become the safest year and why 2017 will be the safest year in the history of Brooklyn. We're down 33% in people who've been shot in this county. We're down over 20% in people who've been murdered in this county and that matters. Okay. Others want to weigh in? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think to, uh, uh, to address the disparities in people who can and can't pay, pay bail, we need to change the bail laws so that uh, the law will allow a judge to, A, uh, um, a risk assessment on whether or not someone will return or whether it's a threat to the community, and if not, then make an appropriate bail or no bail decision, and two, have the judge uh, require the judge to have financial information of the defendant before them before a bail decision is made. Those are two changes in the law that I think will result in a fair system, a system that will uh, result probably in lower bail or no bail, uh, but, also, but, but at the same time gives uh, the prosecutor or the judge the opportunity and the discretion to, to, um, to award bail uh, in the cases that Eric just mentioned where there's some assault and there's some violence where there's some other uh, circumstances going on. Okay. Um, Richard, yes. first and then Anne. Quick. Yes, uh, I, uh, I think the cash bail is immoral. I am uh, vehemently opposed to it. It is a poverty tax. I will not only uh, state to my assistant district attorneys that they are not to ask for cash bail on anything where we wouldn't ask for a jail sentence and where we can't more successfully get them into some treatment or something to get them out of those jails. Um, but I will go to Albany and I will use the bully public of the DA's office to get us to change this cash bail system altogether. Here's something we need to know, Earl. I don't know if you saw the article, check out City Limits viewers, but uh, there was an article today about how despite the fact that acting DA Gonzalez said back in April in a memo, oh, cash bail doesn't, it, it's not a good idea, that all of these organizations, the Defender Services and those that lend money to individuals so they can get out of jail are saying, nothing's changed, it's just as bad as it always was. You can't say it, you have to to do it. So I'm going to I'm going to clear the on, I'm going to clear the record on this because we've been keeping track in the office now for the past 2 months on the number of cases where bail is set. The percentage is 5% of the cases bail is being set in criminal court. There are about 248 people currently in Rikers who are being held in Rikers pretrial detention because of a misdemeanor case. Okay. And so that is out of nearly 40,000 people who've been put before the criminal courts. The policies worked. I've already indicated, if you look at the citywide average, it's closer to 18 to 20 percent. We have 5 percent of Okay. Yeah. Well, that's not enough. I was in charge of alternative sentencing. I created the programs that work today. All this that they're talking about, the drug treatment, the mental health treatment, there is so much more that can be done. Just recently, a homeless person, they asked for $500 bail for stealing cheese. You know what we should do about that? There are so many opportunities for homeless people to get a Metro card to be reminded to come back to court. That's how you get a person to come back to court and give them the food. So it's ridiculous to, not, to think that there's not tons of ways to program our way out of this issue about getting people on low-level crimes back to court. Well, you know, we talk about no cash bail on low levels, but I also believe in no cash bail on felonies, on most felonies. They haven't been convicted of a crime, and I think bail is buying freedom. And that is unacceptable. So I want to talk about no cash, cash bail across the board, not only for low level, but for felony. Okay, thank you very much. That is all the time we have. I want to thank the candidates for a spirited discussion and for being here thank tonight. You. And as a reminder, the primary election is on September 12th, not just for this race, but for all the races here in the city. On behalf of New York One and New York One Noticias, I'd like to thank Brick Arts Media for being a splendid host. Thank you so much for watching. And please remember to vote next week. Have a great evening.